Hoffman with the Hartford Foundation's Nonprofit Support Program. And I wanna welcome you all to today's session on um, board leadership during and after the pandemic. Um, we're delighted to have so many of you with us today, especially the large turnout from board members. Um, we know that this is not your primary job board members and that you're all volunteers. And we want to acknowledge and thank you all for your service to the nonprofits in our community. So thank you so much for being here. We hope that um, you're all doing well, staying healthy and getting outdoors to enjoy the spring weather. And we look forward to the day when we can all gather again in person. So we've learned um, over the past year that Zoom sessions are a team sport. So special thanks as always to my wonderful NSP colleagues, Betsy Johnson and Monica Kelly for all of their behind the scenes assistance and great teamwork in planning for and managing the logistics for today's session. And uh, since it's a question that always come up, comes up, um, we will be sharing the session recording as well as the slides with all of you following today's session. Um, they will also be posted on the NSP website. And in addition to that, Betsy will be posting the survey link for this session in the chat towards the end. And you'll also receive an email with the survey link immediately following the session. Um, it's the only price of admission and we really do value your feedback and take your comments seriously. So please do take a few minutes to complete the survey after the session. Um, our presenter for today will be pausing at several points throughout this morning um, to take questions. So please use the chat because we have a pretty large group. So I think it's gonna be much easier if you just post your questions in the chat um, and we will get to as many of them as we can. Um, our presenter has also very graciously agreed to stick around immediately following the session for a few minutes for what we call after class time. So if there are questions that we can't get to during the session and you want to stick around afterwards, we'll have a few more minutes uh, and a more intimate opportunity to ask questions right after we end. Um, so I'm delighted that our presenter today is Andy Robinson, whom some of you may know. Um, Andy has been a consultant to nonprofits since 1995 and has provided support and training to thousands of nonprofit staff, volunteer leaders, boards across the US and Canada. Um, Andy specializes in the needs of organizations working for human rights, social justice, artistic expression, environmental conservation, and community development, among others. And Andy is, is also the author of several books on governance, including What Every Board Member Needs to Know, Do, and Avoid, Train Your Board and Everyone Else to Raise Money, and The Board Member's Easier Than You Think Guide to Nonprofit Finances. So Andy, the program is all yours. Thank you for having me today. Let me also thank Monica and Betsy for their help putting this all together. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. And in a minute, we're gonna ask you who you are. <laughs> so, um, Mayor, give me a thumbs up that you can see the slide deck, yes? Beautiful. I'm Andy Robinson. Um, today's topic is boards during, after, around the pandemic, how we should be behaving as board members in this moment. And I wanna give you a couple of ground rules. One ground rule is that this is interactive. In a minute, we're gonna put up a poll, ask you some questions. As Mayor mentioned, we're going to be um, soliciting questions throughout via chat, and I'll do my best to address as many of them as I can, either during or perhaps at the after party, we can talk about them then. Um, and also we have a couple of breakouts and we'll, we'll drop you in a room with two or three other people and give you a question to talk about. And I feel like my job as your presenter and facilitator and trainer is not just to share what I know about this topic, but also to create an opportunity for you to share what you know. And sometimes what happens is chat turns into this whole separate track of conversation. And so if you wanna to respond to what I'm saying in chat or you wanna question it, or you wanna yay, yay, that's correct, or I have a different tack, tack um, I'm totally good with that. I really like it. There are multiple conversations going on at the same time. So feel free to use chat to amplify what I'm saying or challenge what I'm saying or ask questions. All of those things are good. Um, as Mayor mentioned, I am a facilitator, a consultant, a trainer, um, a community organizer, an author. I am 40 years in the sector now. I've had my own business for about 25 years. I lived through the dot-com crash. I lived through 9-11. I give, lived through the Great Recession, right? I'm living through the pandemic. I have been through a number of crises. And if you're in the industry for a while, it just happens that way. 
so what we're going to talk about today is about the current moment, but I think it also reflects somewhat on past crises too. So Monica, go ahead and put up the poll if you would. We're curious as to who's in the room today, your role. And you'll see here, um, you could be a board member, staff member, perhaps you're a funder, consultant, perhaps you're a volunteer with none of those other roles. So go ahead and, and tell us who you are and, and pick the category that most closely represents your role. A lot of board members, this is awesome. Yeah, so it's looking about 60% board, about 36% staff, and we have a few funders and consultants joining us as well. Monica, you can end the poll, please, and, and show the results. Excellent. So I want to echo what has already been said. If you're here today as a board member specifically, if you're volunteering your time to learn to be a better board member, um, I honor you. <laughs> That's a big deal. And what I often say about these workshops is whoever comes in some ways doesn't need it because they've already stepped up and they said, I'm trying to get better at this. I want to learn. In some senses, the people who chose not to come are the ones that I'm concerned about. Um, but I'm glad you're here and I hope that to make this productive for you. So I want to know what you want to get out of this. And this is a chance to use chat. If you haven't met chat yet, it's usually on the bottom of your screen. If you scroll around, you'll see a chat function. You click on that, you open it up and, and answer this question. Like, what do you wanna learn? Why, are, why is this subject, why is this topic important? And, and Mayor, while people are typing, I'm gonna pick your brain for a second here because you, you recruited me to present this. What are you hearing from the community? Why do you feel like this topic is germane right now? Well, it's interesting, Andy. I've heard from, it's a mixed bag. I've heard from some nonprofits that their boards have really stepped up during the pandemic and are really trying to figure out how best to help their organizations. Yep. And then I've heard from some others that the boards are not really sure what to do. And I think that may be why we have so many folks here today is they're trying to figure that out. That's good. So we've got some of the stuff popping up in chat, how to motivate and energize our board and myself. Thank you for that. Fundraising, board recruitment. Here's another one on motivation. Um, nice. Mayor, you can, you can jump in too if there's others you're seeing here. Yeah, how to support staff, love that. General confusion about what to do. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. There's some of that going on. Nice. So um, I'm appreciative of your input here. I, I feel like based on what I'm seeing, what we're, what we're offering actually fits what you need pretty closely. So we'll do the webinar and we'll see if that's true. Um, and Mayor, if there's any other themes you're seeing in there, go ahead and share them with me. I know you're tracking chat for me today. Yeah, it's kind of a, a mixed bag of folks kind of wanting to know what to do. Um, there are a unique set of issues with the pandemic. Uh, so it looks like, um, yeah, it's sort of a mix. Cool. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna talk a little bit about how board can best support staff. And the warning is this is gonna be our first breakout. So you can be thinking about that. I'm gonna teach you a couple of tools that you can use to prioritize programming and figure out what to protect, what to keep, maybe what to give away or unload. Um, there are some fairly deep strategic questions that have become present in our lives in the last year that I think all nonprofits need to be paying attention to. We're going to do a little bit of a dive into financial oversight, because this is one of the roles of board members is, is the fiduciary piece. And I've got some questions that I feel like all board members should be able to answer without looking at spreadsheets or board books. And then we're going to also spend a few minutes talking about fundraising because that topic never goes away. There's always a need for that. Um, we're, we're scheduled, I believe, for 90 minutes. As mentioned, we'll, we'll save a little time at the end for questions. And if we go into overtime on more questions, I am totally good with that because I got nothing else scheduled this afternoon. So I will stay here till the questions are all answered. So I want to offer you five or six advisories. And the first one is that this is a moment for compassion. Um, 
how can you as board members, and I realize there's staff members here today, how can you best support the staff? How can you best support each other? What have you done to make your lives collectively a little easier? And, and what I have heard, and I'll, I'll echo in some ways what's been said here, I, I have heard that there have been instances where um, board members have reached out to staff and said, what do you need? I know it's difficult now, how can I support you? I also have heard stories of board members who went AWOL. And, and when the pandemic hit, they sort of tucked their heads into the ground and they were never heard from again, which feels like the, exactly the wrong response to me. So I am curious as to how your board has been supporting the staff. And this is a shout out to the staff who are in the room today, because I feel like this is the first question. And I will acknowledge that perhaps there are some all volunteer groups in the room where you don't have employees. And the parallel question still holds, which is how are you supporting each other? Um, what are you doing to make each other's lives a little easier? So this, if you haven't done breakouts on Zoom, this is how it works. Um, in a minute here, Monica is going to set up, set up invitations to invite you to a room, and it'll say you're invited to room 12 or room 13 or room 6 or whatever, and you click on that button, and you're going to go away, and you're going to find yourself in a room with two or three other people, and you'll have um, four or five minutes on this. It'll go pretty quick. Introduce yourselves briefly. Hi, my name is. This is my group, and then this is the question, and we'll put it in chat. What are you doing now? as a board to support your staff. And I would also add, what are you doing to support each other as board members? What has been your compassionate response in this moment? So we'll give you a couple of minutes to talk through this. It's a good way to warm you up for the class is to get you talking to each other early. So that's my intention here. Um, and we'll have you back in five minutes. Um, Monica, let's make it four-ish minutes, but five is fine. Um, and then we'll see what you talked about. So uh, please join the breakout room when you are invited to do so. Um, so I would love to, to get a quick report via chat. Um, any themes, uh, anything specific that struck you that you wanna share with us all, that would be great. So I'm gonna put the slides back up. Um, and the questions are here. What did you discuss? What did you learn? Um, any next steps or thoughts that came out of that? So feel free to use chat here. And we'll go ahead and see, we'll give that a minute, see what comes in. And Mayor, once again, you're the one monitoring chat here. So if you see good stuff, feel free to shout it out and let me know what you're seeing. Yep, providing resources, paying attention to DEI issues, mm -hmm. um, issues oh, pertaining to vaccinations, huh. <laughs> communicating, staying in touch. I think still some issues around virtual versus in person. Yep. Yeah, this is good. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna move to the second point here, um, which has to do with prioritizing your work and figuring out what you do well um, and how to really lean into the moment based on what you do well. So if the questions here is what are your unique assets? Like, what do you have that nobody else has? What do you do that no one else does? What's your specific niche? And then when you think about your position in the world, Compared to peers, where are you strong? Where are you weak? Um, what have you? What can you offer that they can't? Now, I want to give you a quick tour of a tool that I have used a lot. Um, this is going to be awesome for some of you, and some of you are going to like what? I don't understand this, and that's okay. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I think for the people who for whom it works, it works pretty well. This is called the Macmillan Matrix. This was created by a man named Ian Macmillan at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. And the story is that he was working with a bunch of social service organizations, helping them do strategic planning. And he noticed that most of them were doing their planning in a vacuum. They were just thinking like, what do we wanna do? And they weren't looking at the environment, they weren't looking at the field, they weren't looking at their quote unquote competitive position compared to other organizations. So Dr. McMillan created this matrix and there are four criteria for, for making judgment. 
there's whether something aligns with your mission or not, whether it aligns with your abilities, that's the first one. The second is, is, is this difficult or easy? Easy programs, for example, attract resources, have measurable results, energize people who are doing them, those sorts of things. Then there's the question of competitive position. Like, how are you doing this compared to others who are doing similar work? And then the fourth criteria is the alternative coverage. Like, is other, are other people doing this or not? Is this space open or are we competing for this space? So Dr. McMillan created this document and I sent this out in advance in the materials you have the traditional version and also this one has been rephrased for nonprofits comes to you from a group called the institute for conservation leadership and in the normal universe if we were in a room i would actually put this on the floor i would tape it out really large and we would walk around on it and and use it that way but I, i'll describe it briefly um let's start on the left where it says good fit with mission and abilities poor fit so that's the first question. If you're doing a program, an activity, a service, does that service program activity fit your mission, fit your abilities or not? Yes or no. Then we're gonna go up to the top. Is it easy or is it difficult? And again, easy programs have measurable results, attract money, attract volunteers, um, generate energy. The difficult ones don't do those things. Then we're going back to the left. Compared to other organizations, is your position strong or weak? Are you a leader in that area or is it a secondary piece of work for you? And then going back to the top, we have the alternative coverage high or low, are other people doing it or not? That would be true whether it was easy or perhaps if it was difficult. So I'm just gonna run an example or two here. Imagine that something fits your mission, is relatively easy, other people are doing it, but your position is strong compared to this. So this is number one on the matrix. And it says, affirm this program and negotiate functions with other organizations. Meaning, hey, y'all, we're doing this. This is core work for us. We realize that you're doing it too. We're not going away. Let's have a conversation about how we divide this up in a way that adds value for the community. Let's acknowledge that we're both doing this and let's um, confirm that we can both do it well. And perhaps this becomes a collaboration opportunity. Now, I want to acknowledge that sometimes there's work you want to get rid of. Perhaps there's something that's relatively easy to do, but others are doing it more than you. So, you know, imagine we have the easy program alternative coverage high, but your position is weak. Number three says, give this away quickly. And that's okay. It is okay to take a program that's not your primary work and find a different home for that. So this is a way to think about strategic planning that actually thinks about the whole community and the universe of nonprofits. And the goal here is to figure out when you should lead, when it's best to step back to support other organizations, and when you might actually want to collaborate and do the work together. Now, in my fantasy life, you are actually doing this exercise or some version of this exercise with peer organizations. So, you know, if you're in Hartford and you're working on feeding the hungry and food security, then I could imagine some sort of gathering where all the groups that are working on hunger relief and food security come together and there is a collaborative strategic planning process, which is about this is where you lead, this is where we lead, this is where we lead together, negotiate all that. You know, and the goal here is to serve the community more effectively. It's not necessarily to, you know, support your organization, it's to create change in the community. So, <clears throat> as I said, I am fond of this tool. I have used it often and well. It doesn't work for everybody. And if it feels like it's something that's either over your head or it's not relevant to your circumstances, that's okay. I'm bringing a bunch of tools today and I'm dumping the whole toolbox on the table and you will choose the ones that, that seem most relevant and useful to you. Um, May, are there any questions I need to address? Uh, not yet, Andy. Okay. So, number three. This is a moment, people. <laughs> I mean, in the last year we have dealt with the pandemic, um, we've dealt with a whole major economic disruption. 
questions about racial justice and equity are top of mind in ways that they perhaps haven't been in this country in a long time. This is stuff that's on everybody's plate. And so I think for many nonprofits, there is this moment of, okay, let's look at our mission. Let's look at the circumstances we are in. Let's ask the question, are we relevant? And if not, how do we become more relevant? And if we are relevant, in what ways do we take advantage of this moment to strengthen our organization and strengthen our work? And so I am feeling like as a board member, this is your job, is to ask these sorts of questions. Are we meeting the moment? And, you know, the, this is an old metaphor, but I think it's a classic and I like it. When we're talking about the division of work between staff and board. Here's a way to think about it. The board is down in the jungle trying to make a path. They've got the machetes and they're chopping away and they're trying to get from here to wherever they're going. That's their job in the weeds, literally. The board members are up at the top of the trees going, go that away. You know, the village is over there. The ocean is over there. This is the way board members need to be a little bit above the fray to pay attention to some of these larger strategic questions. And it doesn't mean the staff can't and shouldn't and won't. It simply means because board members are not burdened with the day-to-day -day operation of the organization, they can think a little bigger. They can think a little more broadly. So, we're doing two breakouts today, and the second one is coming up now. And this could be an hour and a half's conversation, right? We're just going to sort of scratch the surface on this. But I am curious as to how the pandemic and all the things that have come out of the pandemic have changed your thinking um, about program delivery, service delivery, um, governance, structure, fundraising. Uh, social justice, whatever. Like, how has this moment, and this moment is now a year plus, changed the way you think about your group? And has it changed the way that board members need to do their work? And, and you can be tactical here. I mean, you can talk about, you know, our board meetings are now on Zoom and we're comfortable with that because people don't have to travel and that might persist. But I'm really more thinking at the strategic level, which is what are the deeper questions you're wrestling with? And you know, you're gonna be dropped in a room with a few people you may or may not know. You can share as thoroughly as you wish to share, or you can hold some stuff back if it doesn't feel comfortable sharing, that's okay too. So we're gonna shuffle the deck. You're gonna end up with uh, two or three or new people. Again, introduce yourselves very briefly and then dive into this question. Um, and we're gonna give you about six minutes on this one. So again, it could be an hour and a half to talk about this, but we wanna get you started. So. Um, Monica, please do your magic thing. Um, have a good conversation, folks. We'll see you back here in a few minutes. Deep topic. And what I want to say about this is I'm queuing up work for you to do internally with your own organizations. All this stuff I'm giving you, the tools and the conversations and the prompts and the questions, this is all meant to spark homework, right? Because I've got you for 90 minutes, but <laughs> this is, this is, me just giving you stuff to work on together with your teams. And, and something that we were looking at when we were coming in today is that many of you have come as teams today. Um, we have staff board combinations. We have some groups that have brought in multiple board members. That is optimal. So if you are starting the conversation now and you didn't finish it, in some ways, that's the point. Um, so thank you for engaging and thank you in advance for following through and having the conversations that I am prompting now in real time. I'm going to share my screen because I'm curious as to what you talked about. So again, this is a chat opportunity. Um, go ahead and put in chat um, what you discussed. You know, and I the second question I think is one of my favorites here, which is what did you learn? Is there any anything that's a takeaway from that conversation? Um, and if you discuss next steps in any ways that you move forward on this question, that would be lovely. And, and while you're chatting, I will reiterate that we are always grateful for your questions throughout the webinar. So if questions come up and you want to pose them, I will do my best to answer them either as we're going through or at the end, perhaps both. Um, let me also say that if you don't get your questions answered and you want to reach out to me individually, 
Um, I am happy to respond by email or phone and try and answer them that way. There's no charge for that. Um, you know, please don't keep me on the phone for an hour. But if I can answer your questions quickly, I'm, I'm happy to help. So um, please don't feel like this is your only bite at the apple. If you don't get it asked or something pops up next week and you think, why didn't I ask that? Reach out to me. My contact information is on the slide deck and you can find me that way. So, um, Mayor, what are we seeing? What, what, are, what were people talking about? Uh, yeah, some interesting things, Andy. Um, definitely the need to sort of use this as an opportunity to adapt. Um, and to use lessons learned during the pandemic in future work. Um, a bunch about sort of increased use of technology, um, how people really stepped up in using technology and how can that continue. Yep. Uh, there were some comments around pivoting to different services as a result of the pandemic, uh, benefits of virtual meetings. So certainly some learnings from all of this. That's excellent. And, you know, I mean, the, the whole equity question around Zoom cuts both ways. I mean, I, I live in a rural part of the world where not everyone has good connectivity. And it's also true in certain urban areas. And so, you know, in some cases, access to broadband is a problem. Um, on the other hand, I, I chair a board and one of the board members has MS and is pretty physically limited. It, I mean, she can get in a car and drive, but it's a real project for her. And so Zoom has made her life easier in a variety of ways. And she can participate in the meetings without having to do that physical labor to get to the meeting room. Um, and I have had other board members who said, you know, henceforth, I am not gonna drive to a board meeting on a winter night when there's snow on the ground, I'm just not gonna do it. So, you know, I feel like one of the things we're balancing is how do we make this equitable for everybody? And the equity question actually cuts both ways. So that's interesting to me. All right. So I'm going to keep moving here. The next thing I want to talk about is, is financial oversight. Um, if you're a trustee of a nonprofit organization, if you're a board member, you are a fiduciary, which is a fancy word that means it's your job to ensure that the organization is financially healthy. And if you are a fiduciary, there's some basic stuff you should know about nonprofit finance. So here's the, here's the sort of mental model here. I want you to imagine that I run into you in the grocery store and you don't have a spreadsheet to look at or you don't have your board booklet. I'm just literally talking to you in the aisle with the produce, right? I'm going to ask you some questions. And I think if you're a board member, you should be able to answer these questions top of mind without looking at your spreadsheets. So here's the first question. Um, what are your current sources of income? Like where do you get your money from now? And what's the strength and weakness of the model? You know, so somebody might say, well, you know, we are a social service organization and we're getting 75% of our budget from the state of Connecticut. And what's good about that is it's a lot of money and we don't have to raise it other than writing the grant proposals, which are a pain in the butt. The risk of that is, you know, we're, we're at the mercy of the legislature and we're mercy of the economy. And as the, as the tax revenue goes up and down, that money can also go up and down. So we're not actually very much in control of our own destiny financially. So maybe you wanna change that mix and maybe you wanna be less dependent on that one source of money. So this is what we call thinking about the business model. What is the business model for the organization? Where is it strong? Where is it weak? How might you strengthen it? So, you know, again, we're in the grocery store. That's where we're having this conversation. I want you to be able to have an articulate conversation about this without the spreadsheets. Second question, um, which of your programs or activities are cost centers versus profit centers? So cost centers cost more money than they bring in. Profit centers bring in more money than they cost. Let us acknowledge we are nonprofit organizations. Our job is not to make a profit. Our job is to serve our communities. I totally get that. And if everything you do loses money, you won't be around for very long. So it's this interesting conundrum. And we have to, if we can't raise the money directly from programming, then we have to subsidize it from other sources. And one of the tools that I appreciate is this thing called the matrix map. This is brought to you by Gene Bell, Jan Masaoka, Steve Zimmerman, three of the geniuses in the nonprofit world. And it's a very simple model. And you can Google matrix map and all sorts of variations will pop up on your screen, which is actually pretty awesome. There are four quadrants here. And 
I want you to look at the axis, the up and down, the right, left axis, up and down, high mission impact, low mission impact. High mission impact, great for the mission, gets a lot of stuff done. Low mission impact, not much happening, moving the mission. Left and right, low fundability, profitability, high fundability, profitability. Doesn't bring in money, brings in money. So the quadrant with the star is stuff that has a high mission impact and actually generates a lot of revenue. That's optimal, right? That's the fantasy, is that we can do a high impact programming that either pays for itself or is easy to fundraise for. That's that quadrant. Go into the left, the one with the heart. Um, a lot of our work ends up in this quadrant. It's the mission work that's hard to fund. And if you end up having some programs or activities or services that land in that quadrant, that is totally fine. That makes sense to me. Um, ideally, you want to slide them to the right as much as you can so they're not total losses. Now, the lower right quadrant with the money tree, that's stuff that doesn't have much of an impact, but it generates revenue for you. And some of our straight up fundraising lands in that category. I mean, that might be your, you know, forgive me for saying it, that might be your golf tournament or something like that that doesn't advance your mission, but it's a net profit center for your organization. Um, the stop, <laughs> that's the stuff that doesn't move your money, doesn't move your mission at all and loses money. And those are the things you want to jettison as quickly as you can. So one way to use this, and again, I, I urge you to Google this and see what pops up. I didn't want to hit you with too many slides, but sometimes what people will do is they'll take their programs and they'll make bubbles, like a little bubble graph, and bigger bubbles are uh, more expensive or larger programs, smaller bubbles or smaller programs, and you would, you would plot them on this graph. And then the conversation is, what do we keep? What do we get rid of? How do we take things that are marginally profitable and make them more profitable? Those sorts of things. Now, an interesting side question is whether your board is actually a profit center or a cost center. And here's a quick story. I have a colleague, executive director at a nonprofit. And this question came to her one day out of the blue. And she said, I wonder if it's costing me more money to have a board than the board is bringing in. So she calculated the cost of having a board. So this is the staff time to manage the board, the cost of board meetings back in the day, feeding the board at the board meetings, cost of meeting space, all those things. Um, she then calculated how much money the board had brought in through its fundraising efforts. And lo and behold, the board was actually costing the organization more money than they were bringing in. They were literally a cost center. And to her credit, she had the courage to go to the board and say, hey, everybody, here's the data. What do we do about this? Now, again, I want to acknowledge that there are many reasons to have a board. It is legally required. The board can provide oversight and ambassadorship and networking and fiduciary oversight, all those things. So I don't know that this is a deal breaker, but I think in the ideal world, and we're going to talk about boards and fundraising in a few minutes, in the ideal world, the board should at least break even. I mean, <laughs> the board should at least generate enough revenue to cover the cost of having a board. That seems reasonable to me. Third question here. Do you have a reserve fund? How do you use it? How much is in it? And, and one way to think about this is not the dollar amount, but how many months you could continue to operate should you had to rely on that reserve. If all your revenue dried up, how long could you stay open just spending down whatever reserves you have? And my understanding is that a good benchmark for most nonprofits is you wanna have three to six months money in the bank in terms of reserve because that gives you enough time to pivot and improvise and find new revenue sources if you need them. Now, this last one, I want to—I would love to get some action and chat on this question here. What is your organization's biggest financial risk? And how will you mitigate that risk? So, I mean, I'll throw out a few just to prompt you. One risk I mentioned is, is a narrow funding base where you get a lot of your money from one donor or one grant or one set of grants. Um, that's a financial risk. But I suppose another financial risk is if you have a longtime executive director who's been there forever and knows all the donors and knows all the funders and people perceive it as that person's organization, if that person goes away unexpectedly, this is the hit by a bus scenario, um, that's a financial risk. 
because a lot of the relationships and the energy and the um, the legitimacy of the organization may be tied up in that person's persona. So as a board member, your job is risk management. And in order to manage those risks, you have to articulate them and you need to talk about them and say, how do we, how do we manage them? So um, if you're willing, go ahead and share. This is a great place to put stuff in chat in terms of what you think about. And you know, maybe the way to ask the question is what keeps you up at night financially speaking for your organization? And, you know, Mayor, I'm going to pick on you for a minute because I'd love to get another voice in here. I mean, you work with a lot of nonprofits. Um, what do you see as, as primary financial risks that some of these organizations are dealing with? Well, I'm just looking at the chat and someone just posted not having a strong base of individual donors. Um, yeah. Not having the board is involved and having a coherent sort of fundraising strategy and plan. Yep. Uh, someone else just posted possible loss of members is our worst risk. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, you know, one of the things that's going on here, I mean, this is a solvable problem, but the average age of an American donor has gotten older. And so we have a graying demographic. We have, you know, boomers giving money and boomers <laughs> moving through. And so one of the things that a lot of organizations are thinking about is how do we find younger donors and how do we bring them in and keep them and recruit them and upgrade them and all those things. So I think that's real. Good. Anything else in chat you want to share? Uh, someone posted over-reliance on a few major institutional yep. funders. Yep. And then someone ma made the um, the comment that these are good questions to ask in our personal lives <laughs> as well. <laughs> right on. Yeah, it's true. Um, yes, I, I could go, I could go off on a long tangent about that, but I will save us all that. Yeah. So this is a good segue to the fundraising part of this. If you're a board member, item number five here is to the funders. And there are some notes. First of all, um, we had a good, we, the nonprofit community, had a good fundraising year last year. This surprised a number of people because of the pandemic and the economic shakeout. But the early data for 2020, um, this is through something called the Fundraising Effectiveness Project, and you can Google that if you want to see the data. They're very well respected, and they do good data collection. Early data from the Fundraising Effectiveness Project is that overall philanthropy grew by 10% last year, and the biggest growth area was small donors, meaning people who gave $250 or less per donation. Um, that area grew by 15%. So one thing that happened during the pandemic, and I hope will continue through 2021, is that those who are in a position to give, and it's not everybody, those who are in a position to give, gave more. And I'm hearing a lot of these stories, um, which, you know, in my position is, is awesome. As someone who's a fundraising consultant, it's really good to hear that people are succeeding and they're making this work. So if you're a trustee, one of your jobs to the best of your financial ability is to give. And I hope you're continuing to support your organizations financially, again, as best you can given your circumstances. Um, the second point here is we spent some time talking about fiduciary responsibility. It's not just stewarding the resources you have. It's not just spending the money carefully. It's also generating more money. And I will quote my colleague, Kim Klein. She's one of the gurus of grassroots fundraising. And, and Kim says, most people's instinct is to cut expenses rather than raise money. And then she says, resist this impulse as much as possible. And I think that's huge. I mean, the first question we have to ask is how do we generate more revenue, not how do we slash expenses, cut staff, cut benefits? That's the last question you ask. First question is how do we get more resources? And the final note here is the more people who are helping you do this, the more money you raise. It is a team sport. So I want to give you some tools for boards and fundraising. There are, are four things you need to be good at this. You need to have a case, right? You have to articulate what you do and why you do and why the community should value what you do. You need potential donors. They could be individuals. They could be foundations. They could be businesses. They could be government agencies. But you need people to go out and ask. You need folks who will then do the asking. And you need systems. You have to send out the thank you notes. You need a database. You have to track the money, all those things. Um, I didn't mention this earlier. I have now worked in 47 states. I have worked in Canada. I've been on the road for a lot of years back in the day when we went on the road. 
Um, I have worked with literally thousands of nonprofits. This is what I see. The case is there. You know, I bet everybody on this call today, you can tell me why your work is valuable and why the community benefits from what you do. I'm sure you could articulate it better, but you have the case. There are far more donors than you realize. I'll try and prove this to you in a few minutes. The systems are never perfect, but for many of us, they are inadequate. We get the notes out, we track the data, we track the money, and we do that stuff. The weakest link for nearly every nonprofit is the third one. There's not enough people, including board members, who are out engaging with donors. But conundrum. Not everybody wants to be an asker, right? This is like the scary part of fundraising. So I feel like if we're going to get our boards into the game, and have them develop some comfort as fundraisers, we have to redefine the word fundraising. It is not about money. It's almost never about money. It is about relationships and people and how we treat people. So here's um, a tool that I am fond of. And if you're involved in fundraising in any way, you have probably seen variations on this. It's called the cycle of fundraising. And it's a, it's a graphic, a mental model to help you think about how fundraising works. Generally, we would start on the lower left where it says identify prospects. We find potential donors, educate and cultivate. We get them excited about our work. Ask, we ask them to give, we ask them to make a donation. Thank and recognize. We look for ways to appreciate them and show them that we are grateful for their support. And then the involved more deeply is after they have been thanked, what do you do to strengthen their connection to the organization. If we're good, we take the people that we have involved more deeply and we say to them, hey, do you know anyone else who might wanna support this work? Who do you know that could be helpful? And you use those people you've involved more deeply to identify new prospects and you have then completed the cycle. What I'm showing you here is the modern theory of fundraising. Anything you need to know theoretically about how fundraising works, here it is. You learned it in a minute and a half. It's not complicated. Now, if we define fundraising as asking, there are many people, including many of your board members, who won't get there. Um, this thing about asking for money is just terrifying to a lot of folks. And, you know, I train askers. It's part of what I do. I would love it if everyone was an asker. Uh, that's not realistic. It's not going to happen. So, you know, I don't think everyone has to be an asker, but the way I would frame this is here is a holistic approach to fundraising. Your job as a board member is to find the place on this cycle where you can be most productive and feel good about how you're participating. So I have a bias in this conversation. My bias goes like this. I don't think that everyone is an asker, but I do think that everyone is a fundraiser. And the everyone in that sentence is all the board members, your best volunteers, the staff, um, participant of the program of your clientele, they can help with this. Like everybody involved in your organization can help deliver a piece of this. So I am the equal opportunity fundraising guy. I don't think this is a job for specialists. I think it's a job for everybody. If we divide it up in a way where everybody can do a piece of it realistically and effectively. In terms of where we spend our time, um, this comes from Tina Sincotti, who's a wonderful consultant based in Boston. And Tina took the model and carved it up by time allocation. And so it starts at the top, identify, involve, ask, thank, involve more deeply. Please notice that the ask, the little slice at the bottom, is like 10% of the work. And we're all stressed out about asking for money. It's not even where the work is. The work is all the other stuff on that cycle. So yes, you do. someone needs to ask. That is totally part of fundraising. That's not the work. The work is all the relationship management, the work you do before, the work you do after, how you keep people in the family once they've given all of that. So let me pause here. Mayor, is there anything in chat, any questions for me to address? Uh, not this minute, but earlier, Andy, there had been a sort of a fundraising question which said, um, what should we do with fundraising events that were either truncated or yeah. shut down due to the pandemic? Great question. Okay, I'm sighing here. You can hear me sighing. <laughs> um, I'm gonna give you a two-part answer. Part number one, when we study fundraising strategies and we rank them by efficiency, meaning how much money you get back for the effort and time and money you put in, 
fundraising events are near the bottom of the list. And events are good for promotion. They are good for having FaceTime with your donors. They're good for building a cohort, for building a community. I understand the value of fundraising events. As pure profit centers, they tend to stink. So the fact that we are doing fewer events these days, I have mixed feelings about that. I see that, I feel your pain. I also think if this forces people to think about other strategies that might be more efficient, maybe that's okay. Um, so that's one answer to your question. Um, the second answer to your question is you gotta get creative. And I think the future is probably going to be hybrid events and hybrid activities where some people are physically together and some people are coming in remotely on Zoom or whatever other platforms. And I have attended a number of virtual fundraising events in the last year that have been pretty good. And, you know, I didn't have to drive anywhere and I didn't have to get dressed up and I sort of appreciated that. Um, so, you know, again, this is not my deepest area of expertise. I think as I think it's going to be fine this summer for you to do outdoor events if they're relatively small in size. And Mayor Betsy, Monica, remind me, I will send you a bunch of stuff about fundraising house parties and, I, and you can share them with the group. A fundraising house party is the small private event with 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 people, presumably in a private home, though it doesn't have to be. You could do it in the yard. You could do it outside your facility. I mean, homes are nice because they're more intimate. Um, but I think this is going to be the summer of the house party because it's something that we can do. People can socially distance a little. It's much safer outdoors. I think the comfort level will be higher. And if you're used to doing a big once a year event that draws 300 people, what you might think about is, is there a house party strategy where we could do four or five of these throughout the year, inviting different people and take one large event and break it into a handful of smaller, more intimate events. And the advantage of that is there less work to organize and, and you can strengthen relationships because you can actually have conversations with people. And at the end of the day, they may end up being more profitable because of the less work and the amount of money you can raise. So that's where I would steer you, I think. Okay, so now I wanna give you an example of how this cycle of fundraising looks when you implement it. And with apologies for the slide, which is small, we did send this out to you as a PDF, so you should have it. And if not, let us know and we'll get it to you. This is from a group called the North Lakeland Discovery Center. They are a nature center in Wisconsin. And this is amusing to me because I have never met these guys, but I trained them on Skype about 10 years ago before it was a thing. Um, and we had, you know, one of these remote trainings and I trained them what I just trained you. And uh, I said to them, I want you to build out this cycle in a way that makes sense for you. I want to figure out, want you to figure out what steps or tasks you would put into each of these categories, identify prospects, educate, cultivate, et cetera. So I left the call and they sat around the table for another hour and this is what they created. And I think it's brilliant because this is an entire donor relationship management model that fits on one page and it's self-created. I mean, no consultants were involved. They didn't hire any professionals. They just did it themselves and they did it really well. So I won't read all of this, but I'll click through it. Under identify prospects, they came up with five different strategies to find new donors. Educate and cultivate, they came up with seven tasks there. The ask, eight different ways to ask for a gift. Thank and recognize, there's eight different strategies to thank donors after they've given. Inclusive involvement, that's the involved more deeply. There's six items there. They pulled the staff and the board together and they did a little mini training and sort of shared the stuff I've already shared with you today. And then they gave everybody a copy of this page and they said, this is how we propose to implement this model. And the idea is that everyone's going to help. So I want you to look at this carefully and offer any changes you want to suggest. Like, what do we forget? So there were a few amendments, a few hands went up. Then they said to everybody, write your name on the top of the page. And then they said to everybody, we're going to have three minutes of quiet. I want you to read this carefully and everybody check off three items that you personally are willing to help do. And they were very instructive. They said, don't pick stuff that's weird and awkward you're not going to follow through on. If you read it and you think, yeah, I can do this, that's the one I want you to choose. So everybody sat there quietly, read it, checked off three items, turned in their forms. The fundraising staff went back to the office and they made a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet are here are all the tasks and here are all the people. 
and where do they intersect? And then they started to have a way to bring everybody into the fundraising model. So for me, this is foundational. Um, I think a really bad question to ask a board member is, will you help with fundraising? Because I don't know what that means. Like, what do you want me to do? And I think a stronger model is to say to them, here are tasks that need to be done. Pick the tasks where you need, where you can be helpful. So my homework for you, I'm going to go backwards here just for a minute. You will remember this cycle of fundraising. My homework for you is to bring this back to your board. And I've given you a sample. And what I've also given you in the packet is the template, the blank, the empty. And I feel like if you can train up your own people on this model and you say, okay, what's the relevant uh, steps for us? And again, you have the cheat sheet, right? You've got a sample to work off of that makes life a little easier. And I feel like this is foundational. If you're gonna get your board to help with fundraising, you gotta get it down to the task level and they have to be relevant to your mission and your donor base and your capacity. So, Once you've done this, you might think in terms of the menu. And this is another sample that we shared out. And these two, are they overlap some. And you could pick one or the other, or you could do both. But I want to give you both tools, and you'll decide which one works for you. Um, here's a sample. This comes to you from a group called Garden City Harvest. They're in Missoula, Montana. They're a, an urban gardening organization. And they generated a list of tasks for board members to help with fundraising, and they literally put it in the form of a menu. So we have appetizers, we have entrees, and we have desserts. And the principle here is that each board member picks one appetizer, one entree, one dessert, that becomes their work for the year. And what I love about this model is everybody's got to help, but how you help, you get to choose. And, you know, this is not dissimilar if you've ever, you know, raised a three-year-old, you've had the conversation of, do you want to wear the red socks or the blue socks, right? Are you going for the pink shirt or the green shirt? And in psychology, right? It's like, here's a, here's a defined list of choices. Choose the thing that you are able to do. So what I would have you do is use the sample to brainstorm the version that's relevant to your organization. Once you've done that, and I'll show you the, the document, you get it in the form of a fundraising agreement. So people are actually writing down the tasks that they are taking on. And then you could actually use this at meetings to do check-ins. And you could say, once everyone's filled out the menu, you could go around the table and say, everybody talk about what they're going to do. Everybody talk about what they've done in the last month to support fundraising. And if you want to build a culture of fundraising into your board and into your organization, we want to have some accountability baked into that. And I think it's easiest if people just self-report. You don't have to call them out or shame them or anything. Saying We're going to take five minutes at the beginning of every board meeting, and we're going to go around the table, and everybody's going to talk about how they have engaged in fundraising since our last meeting. And if you have, haven't done anything, but you have something planned, talk about that. And, you know, on one hand, it's accountability. On their hand, it's sort of inspiring because then people are actually doing stuff and you think, wow, we're making progress here. This is good. So I do like a good fundraising menu. I think this sample is good for you to work off of. And if you like it, use it. Where this goes, and this is another document we shared with you, is the board fundraising agreement. And this is based on three things, board members providing a donation, board members helping identify donors, board members selecting fundraising tasks. There's two pages here in terms of slides. So it says, to support the mission of our organization, I agree to take on the following. So the first one is about my gift and how I'm gonna make payment. The second one is about prospects. And it says, I will provide name and contact information for a certain number of prospects by a certain date even if I am unable to follow up with all these people personally, I will still add names to the list for mailings, event invitations, et cetera. And then we get to the menu here. Um, my fundraising support tasks taken from our menu. Activity, date, projected revenue, if applicable, because not every task generates revenue, help and support needed from the board. 3A, 3B, 3C, presumably the appetizer, the entree, and the dessert. Uh, and then there's signatures, signature of board member, signature of board chair. Uh, I would love to tell you this is a legally binding document. <laughs> I don't think it is, 
but I think there is the ritual of signing the paper and solemnizing that. And somehow that feels important to me. So that's the boards and fundraising stuff I wanted to present today. And I will pause and Mayor, if you've got any questions coming in on boards and fundraising or anything else, I'm happy to try and address them. And if you guys, if you're out there and you wanna ask questions about boards and fundraising, this would be a great moment to do it. Yeah, Andy, there's a couple of endorsements of uh, house parties, especially those hosted by board members. If nothing yeah. else, people are curious to see what board members' homes look like, even if they aren't um, <laughs> fancy. <laughs> and, uh, and then here's another great turning a crisis into an opportunity sort of thing. Patty posted that one of their fundraising events was when their day camp was canceled due to a tropical storm, and they gave the choice of either getting a refund or donating to the <sighs> camp. Nice. Um, so again, I think what a great example of sort of turning a crisis into a great opportunity for the organization. Well, I mean, I'll give you a minor version of this. It's not a crisis, but it's an opportunity. I, I'm chairing a board where we have one employee. I mean, the organization has one employee. That's it. And our one employee is uh, giving birth to her second child um, sometime in June. And we talked about it and we decided to do a baby pool and people are going to guess the birth date. Um, and the time and the weight. And, and um, the the winner will, the prize for the winner is they get to uh, suggest names for the baby. And of course the parents can say, no, thank you. We've already got a name. So it's sort of, you know, it's sort of a non-prize but the money will go to the organization. Um, so, you know, we're not gonna make a lot of money on this but it felt like it was opportunistic in a good sense of the word. And, you know, I'm excited by that. Um, any other questions to address? Not at the moment. Okay. So I want to pull back here because um, this whole conversation is about how do we create more resilience in our organizations? How do we make them more uh, adaptable, strong, tough, um, creative in the face of whatever crisis it is? I mean, again, the last year has been multiple challenges, crises, and moments of opportunity. So in a second, we're going to fire up chat, and I'm going to see if you can add to my list here. But when I think about a resilient organization, these are the things that I think about. First of all, are we in good relationships with, with peer organizations? Do we support peers and other groups in the space? Are we providing that sort of mutual aid? Are we like out on an island by ourselves, or do we got people? Um, resilient organizations have networks. They have people. They have mutual support. The second bullet here we've talked about already, which is the diversity of the revenue and having some money in the bank so that your, your business model um, has some flex in it. I think you need to have contingency plans and even a contingency budget. And you know, this is another thing I'm happy to share some contingency budget examples of somebody from the Hartford Foundation Republican and will remind me to send them to you. You can share them to everybody. But the idea here is you have budget scenario A, B, and C. And so A is worst case, B is middle case, um, maybe C is best case, like we got some windfall we weren't expecting. And it may have happened to some groups in the last year. Contingency plans are about what happens if. And you know it's sort of easy to skate along with whatever assumptions you have, and it's a little harder to plan for things you don't know what, what's coming, but I think every organization needs that. The fourth bullet here is around leadership succession. Um, this is close to my heart as an aging boomer. And I see a lot of my peers who are sort of locked into their organizations for a long time, and they're often skilled and good at what they do, uh, but there isn't necessarily, they haven't necessarily created the pipeline of the next generation of leadership and creating opportunities for those folks to lead. So especially if you have staff who have served for a long time or you have board members who've been on the board for 20 plus years or something, you need to be thinking about transitions. And you need to be doing that proactively. Now, the last one is really subtle, but it's also close to my heart. We have to sort of start from a place of abundance. And there are some people who start from scarcity and scarcity is there's not enough money. There's lots of competition. There's not enough resources. How do we hoard what we have? How do we protect what we have? Um, and I won't criticize that, but I will say it's not the only way to be in the world. And there are some people, and I'm one of those people who's a little more wired, which is like, wow, look at everything that's out there. How do we get some of that? And I think 
the more resilient organizations tend to lean into how do we adapt to this moment and turn it into something good? And it's a cultural thing. And it has to do with how leadership projects that. And I think it also happen, has to do with board recruitment. I mean, I, I want to recruit some people on the board who are optimistic and um, abundance-minded and are not just how do we manage the scarce resources that we have. You need some of those people too, for sure. But I want some people who think broadly um, and are not afraid to go out and find additional resources if that's what you need. So that's my list. And I would love to have you add to my list. So this is a chance to use chat. Um, when you think about organizational resilience and adaptability, what do you think about? And go ahead and put it in there and we'll just take a look and see what people are sharing there. Oh, Chris, thank you. Investing in the staff through compensation benefits and professional development. Amen. Yeah, we have to treat the staff as the professionals they are and invest in them in all the different ways we can. So that's beautiful. Thank you for naming that. Anyone else have any thoughts on the resilience? Yes, loving the culture of abundance, diversity of partnerships and board members. I think this is big. So I'm going to riff on this for a minute here. In the ideal world, your board represents the community you serve in all ways. And um, a tendency we have, I think, is to cherry pick people who are more powerful or um, perhaps more wealthy rather than filling our board with people in the communities we serve. And I think this is a both and. Um, so theory of nonprofits is that we don't pay taxes, right? And people give us money, it's tax deductible, but in exchange for that, we're supposed to be serving the communities in which we are embedded. And the theory of the law is that the community is governing the organization and the way the community governs the organization is the board members come from that community. So I think that is a resilience piece and I appreciate that. Um, so good stuff popping up here. I appreciate the comment about the morale of staff. I think that's big. Mayor, what are you seeing here? Yeah, please unmute. Sorry. <laughs> Adapting uh, the mission to community needs, um, the need for creative thinkers and people who are flexible, both staff and board. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of things. Yeah, that's great. This is nice. All right. Please note, because she's on top of stuff, the um, Betsy's already posted the survey monkey in chat. We're not even done yet. Well done, Betsy. Um, but we will be surveying you and you'll get a reminder on that later as well. So that's great. Um, I am now open for any questions that you want to ask about anything we talked about or perhaps anything we didn't talk about. Chat is your friend again. If you're uncomfortable with chat and you want to raise your hand, there's a raise your hand function, or you just want to unmute and verbally ask a question, I think we can manage that. So chat is the preferred strategy. Um, and I'm actually going to make the slide deck go away for a minute so I can see everybody. Um, any questions? Andy, there was one um, question that was posted earlier about, um, do you know what percentage of boards actually, or board members sign on to make their own financial commitment as well as to um, soliciting financial commitments from others? Well, I, I don't know that there's industry-wide data on that. It's a good question. I don't know that I have data on that. I can tell you a best practice here, which is I think all board members should give at whatever level they are able to give. And you know, to be sort of blunt about this, I want poor people on your board. I want rich people on your board. I want middle income people. I want all of them. And I absolutely believe that everybody can give something. And one of the reasons I say this is that you will have an experience in your fundraising life where you will sit down with a potential major donor or a foundation and they will ask you this question. And they will say, do you have 100% board giving? And if you can't say, you bet 100% everybody on the board is a donor, they look at you and they start laughing and they say, why are you talking to me? Talk to your own people, then come and talk to me. So I think you need to inoculate yourself for that conversation using the, you know, the vaccination metaphor here um, by, by trying to get at least asking for everybody on the board to give. Now, here is the blowback. Board members will say, I give my time, isn't that more valuable? And my answer is absolutely, yes, yes, heck yes, your time is more valuable, totally get that. Here's the problem. 
I went to Verizon. I tried to pay the phone bill with your time. It didn't work so well, right? I went to the landlord. I offered to pay the rent with your time. The landlord was not interested in your time in lieu of rent. So as, as a trustee, as a board member, we ask you to do both. We ask you to donate whatever financial resources you can give, and we ask you to provide volunteer time to the organization. Other questions? Uh, there's another question in the chat, Andy, about board mentorship, and what's your take on that? Having maybe more experienced board members mentor newer board members. Yes, yes, yes. I believe in the buddy system. And I think when a new board member comes on, they need to have somebody who will talk them through all the stuff that's not in the board book, you know, the board culture stuff, the old history that people may, you know, I, I worked with a client once who said all the important conversations at our board meetings happen out in the parking lot after the board meeting is over. And that's the definition of dysfunction, right? And if you're a new, a new board member and you get dro dropped into that environment, like, how do you parse that? How do you figure that out? So you need somebody who's been around to say to you, yeah, you know, you see the body language between those two, there's some history there. Let me explain that to you. Or here's something that we have talked about doing, but it never got into the board orientation book. So let you need to know that it's on the agenda anyway, and we're going to keep bringing it up until we start doing it. Um, so yeah, I think mentorship is lovely. Thank you for raising that. Don't see any other questions, but please feel free folks. Now's your yeah. chance. I'm going to show you a couple more slides while you're doing that because we're coming down to the end. This is lovely. So here, this is like the most important question of the day, which is what might you implement from what you learned this afternoon? And obviously, I'm not your instructor in the sense that I can't give you homework and then collect your homework in two weeks and see how you did. But I can ask for that, right? So uh, this is uh, this is really useful to put this in chat for two reasons. First of all, if you actually share it, if you write it down and share it, um, you're more likely to follow through and do it. Also, when other people see what your implementation steps are, they're like, yeah, I want to do that too. So this is a way for you guys to inspire each other. So um, take a second and think about this. You know, we covered a lot of content. Hopefully some of it was useful and interesting. How will you implement? So... I'm just going to be quiet for a minute while you think about that. Andy, there is one person that has raised their hand. I think it's Manon Champagne, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And on, you're yes. on, go for it, unmute. Yes, my question is regarding the relationship between board members and the staff of an organization. What's the, uh, what's the ideal uh, relationship? Is it going through the executive um, only or is it being able to, to speak and go directly to the yeah. staff or yeah. having staff attend board meetings sometimes and what what's what would be the uh, the ideal way to to manage the relationship? Yeah, so this is an awesome question, and it's actually more complex than it looks on the surface. Um, some of it depends on the size of the organization. You know, as I said, I chair a board where we have one employee, and that employee comes to all the board meetings as invited, and we need her at all the board meetings. And you know, I interact as a chair, I interact with her a lot, but there are other people who do too, and it's pretty informal and it seems to work fine. There are other organizations where the structure is that all the communication with staff goes through the CEO or the executive director. And there are times when that makes total sense because you really don't want individual board members micromanaging the staff. Right. Yeah. It's a problem. Right. But I have to also say that I once served as development director for an organization where all the communication with the board had to go through the executive director. And it was a total power play because she wanted to filter everything that went through the board to the staff and vice versa for her own means. Um, and my ability to, as a fundraiser, my ability to interact with the board on fundraising was actually pretty limited and it made it harder to do my job. So I don't know that there's a textbook answer to this question. I mean, I, I'm going to say it depends, and that's just an unsatisfying answer. 
but the way I would look at it is in your current model, from your perspective anyway, what's working and what isn't working? And would a change in that structure help things to work more effectively? Um, but, but sadly, I can't give you one answer because I don't think it's, I don't think there is one. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. All right, I'm gonna look at implementation. I wanna know what you're gonna do because this is where I find out if I actually earned any money today. Because the whole point is for you to do stuff. Yes, thank you. Promote more discussion around contingency budgets. Thank you, Eric. Advocate and promote yeah, this is good. This is excellent. Hey, jumping out at you, Mayor, what are you seeing? I think there's some comments about sort of sharing with other board members who yeah. are not here today, yeah. which I think is a great idea. <laughs> I totally agree. Yeah, yeah, this is a train the trainer workshop. We didn't sell it that way, but that's what it is. So I am an author of a number of books, and this is one of them that's most relevant called. Uh, what every board member needs to know, do and avoid. You can check it out if you're interested. This is where you can find me at andyrobinsononline.com and also trainyourboard.com, which is a website and a blog and e-news and a lot of other things. Um, the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving does not give me all your email addresses and I understand why, but you can reach out to me and you can be added to my list on your own. And you can, you know, you can put your email in chat now if you're moved to do so, or you can just find me here and send me your email and I'll go ahead and add you and that's great. Um, I send out e-news a couple of times a month, upcoming webinars, I have a blog, I have a lot of guest posts that are pretty interesting and I would love to stay in touch with you that way. So um, we'll take any other questions. As we're gathering them, let me thank several people. I wanna thank the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving and the staff who's here today, which is Mayor and Betsy and Monica, all of whom are awesome. They're so easy to work with. They are professional, they are organized, they are thoughtful, they are creative, and they are proactive. And if you're in Central Connecticut, now you all are, this is an amazing resource. Um, you are lucky to have these people in your community. So respond. You know, like when they ask you for stuff, do it. You know, when there's opportunities, use them. This is one of the ways they can measure their impact is how many people show up and whether they then implement the stuff we talked about. So it's an awesome resource in your community. Um, be grateful for them and show your gratitude. And um, let me thank you all for the work you're doing in the community. Um, it's a challenging time to be a nonprofit organization, but it's also an awesome time. And you know, it's sort of like, how do we hold both of those things? The challenge and also the opportunity. And I'm seeing a lot of great stuff happening and I'm enthused by it. So appreciating all of you from a distance. And if I can be supportive or if there are questions I didn't answer and you just wanna reach out individually to me, I'll be trying, happy to try and do that. Um, Mayor, let me give you the last word. Sure, thanks Andy. And just so that everyone knows, we're going to move now to our after class time. So if there are folks that are more comfortable asking Andy a question um, in a smaller group setting, stick around because we're gonna shift to that. If you have to go, that's perfectly fine too. Um, and I wanna just take a minute and thank Andy um, for today's session. Really appreciate all of the great information and resources that he's provided, which you will be getting by tomorrow. And as Betsy has been posting, please do take the survey, let us know what you thought and let us know what else you need so that we can continue to provide sessions that are useful to you. So again, if you need to hop off, great. If you want to stick around and ask Andy a question, um, we're going to start the after class time right around now. <laughs>